Folks, I'm going to give you a blessing here. I'm going to give you the same gift that I give my students at commencement. I'm going to give you a short talk. And when I say that at my commencement addresses, I often can guarantee a standing ovation. So you can clap now if you'd like. Actually, I'm serious. I've timed this, and I believe it'll go about uh, 16 to 20 minutes, depending on the cadence here. But I would like to give you a brief uh, extended introduction of myself, because I think context is always important when you're listening to somebody talk. Everything, in in including the way we read the Word of God, needs to be taken in context, correct? Well, context. I am a poor kid from a blue-collar family with a truck driver dad and a uh, odd job mom from the um, factory towns of southern Michigan where my mom and dad didn't have a high school diploma and there was nothing expected of me other than perhaps get that high school degree and then go to work in the local factory and make money. And that's what I did. I got that high school degree and I got a job in the best auto supply, auto parts company in our town. Is that me or is this Okay. So I want you to understand the importance of education in my life. I understand that education can change a person's life. I understand that it can be a way to, uh, up and out, if you will. I understand that there are many who would have looked at me and my family of being on the other side of the tracks and they would have said, he can't do it. He can't rise to any standard that's expected of him. He just needs to do what he's, a, what he's predestined to do, if you will, in life, and that is to be a factory rat. And I categorically reject all of those assumptions. So anybody who's here tonight who thinks that our kids from the oil patch towns of Oklahoma cannot rise to some level of education equal to those of more privileged backgrounds, I don't have much in common with you. These kids can be educated, they can learn, they can rise, they can achieve, and they can accomplish great things. Okay? So I am not here to advocate not having standards. In fact, G.K. Chesterton was fond of saying this, there is no freedom without fences. If you want your kids to be free, free to play on the grandest playground in, in, the, in the country, Chesterton said, then you had better build a fence around that playground because if you don't, those kids will run outside the boundaries of the playground into the highways and the byways and they'll get run over and they will get killed. You see, they aren't free to play unless they recognize the boundaries that are set up by somebody that knows more than them. There is no freedom without fences, folks, and there is no liberty without law. I'll say that again. There is no freedom without fences and there is no liberty without law. So what I want to talk to you tonight is not about the details of Common Core. I do not consider myself an expert of those details. I'm an educator, I'm an academic. I'm one of these guys that believes in the higher ideals, the higher value of life-changing education and ideas. So I'm going to talk to you about what I consider the macro ideas, the big ideas of Common Core, of education. I'm going to talk to you about freedom, about liberty, about academic freedom. Okay, so that's the context. Are you ready, class? If you pay attention, you might get uh, some Oklahoma Wesleyan credit if you want to pay me 500 bucks a credit hour to get it after this. <laughs> All right, I am going to stay on script right now because I think what needs to be said tonight needs to be said clearly, and I don't want to be misquoted or misunderstood. I often speak extemporaneously, but I'm not going to do so tonight. This will be on script, so here we go. Folks, I want you to imagine with me, if you will, that we live in a day where we intentionally sever a man's arm from his body and then expect him to win a fight. Where we pluck out a woman's eyes from her head and then ask her to paint her own portrait. Where we surgically remove a child's frontal lobe and then demand that she explain an algebraic formula. Imagine with me that we live in a world where, as C.S. Lewis warned, the elite among us actually claim it makes sense to geld the stallion and then bid him be fruitful. Imagine that we live in a time and a place where the wise and learned in our courts and in our classrooms and unfortunately even in some of our churches actually work to remove a man's soul and then expect him to stay, stay out of hell. I would argue that such a day is upon us. You see, bad ideas will breed bad behavior as sure as an acorn will grow an oak or a hurricane will bring a flood. For example, why would we expect decades of teaching sexual promiscuity in our schools to result in sexual restraint 
in our students? Why would we be surprised at the selfishness of our culture when we have indoctrinated several generations of our children in a curriculum that elevates self-esteem above the science, above science and civics? How can we possibly think that teaching values clarification rather than moral absolutes will raise up a virtuous people? Where in the annals of all of human history is there any evidence whatsoever that the subordination of one person's right to live to another person's right to choose ever resulted in the protection of every person's unalienable right to life? And why in the world would any culture ever think that after decades of diminishing the value of marital fidelity, that that same culture would then be able to mount a vigorous defense of the meaning of marriage? See, I could go on and on. I think my point is clear. All you need to do to turn, is to turn on the nightly news to see the proof. When we separate fact from faith, and head from heart, and belief from behavior, and religion from reason, we do not, folks, we do not usher in a day of liberty, but one of licentiousness. We become what Lewis warned, men without chests, where there is nothing but a gaping cavity in the center of our being where instead of finding the fullness that comes from fidelity, we find the emptiness of a love affair gone bad. We live in such a day and such a time. We are destroying ourselves with our own dishonesty. We boast of freedom, but yet we live in bondage to our own deception. We champion human rights, and yet we live in a time and a place where we ignore the rights promised to us by revelation and reason in our own constitution. We say that women should not be subjugated to the power and passions of men, but then we embrace leaders who publicly use women for their own selfish whims. As adults, we draw a line in the sand to defend the rights of children, but then we affirm judges that blur the lines between these same children and the predatory adults who claim there are no lines. We indeed are what M. Scott Peck called people of the lie. It seems as if the road to hell is before us and we enter its gates strutting with the confidence of an emperor with no clothes. And when we are challenged, the arrogant among us in the pinnacles of power and privilege belittle the naivete of the masses who dare shout out of their nakedness. Perhaps the loudest lesson of our day is actually an echo of the voices of the past who argued for self-evident truths, who believed that liberty is given by God and slavery is constructed by man. Conserving revealed truths is the only context for freedom and liberation. History has shown us time and again that without God's objective standards as our rule and our measure, men and women will find innumerable ways to enslave themselves and each other while all the time waving a sanctimonious banner of liberty. My point here in this long introduction to the ideas that follow is this. Ideas have consequences. Okay, that's a very simple concept, folks. Ideas have consequences. They always lead somewhere. They never lie fallow. They always grow. And good ideas lead to good places and good behavior and good culture. And bad ideas lead to bad places and bad behavior and bondage and slavery. You see, I believe Common Core is a bad idea with bad consequences, and I'm going to explain to you why. The goal of good education should be the pursuit of what is good and true and just and right and real, not the protection or the propagation of what is common. Good education has never been about dumbing down the academy to a group of, of ideas that are agreed upon by the powerful and the popular. The goal of the educator should be the pursuit of truth, not the construction of what is common. Education should be about an open mind that challenges the consensus rather than a set of closed constructs of commonality that capitulate to the mediocrity of the group and groupthink and the collective opinion. Classical education, liberal education, if you will. Sidebar, do you realize that the Liberal Arts Academy was established in 1090 in Oxford to do what? Educate a free society, a free culture, a free man. Liberal arts education 
stood for liberty and liberation and freedom and justice. The bigger, the better ideas that moved you beyond the bondage, the bondage, the slavery of your own sin and that of others. A liberal education was not something that stepped away from God in his revelation, but toward him and the freedom and the justice that only he could define. Liberty, liberation. A classical liberal education is not one about average ideas. It's not about what everyone else thinks. Good education pursues whatever is true and whatever is noble and whatever is right and whatever is pure and whatever is lovely and whatever is admirable. The best education should be about what is excellent and praiseworthy and it should encourage the learner, the student, to think about such things. And as C.S. Lewis admonished, to not be too easily satisfied with playing in the mud in the back alley when we could all aspire to a grand vacation at the beach. I am against Common Core, and I am against it because I'm a believer. I believe in academic freedom. Get that. That's my key point. I believe in academic freedom. Freedom to pursue the uncommon, the exceptional, the unpopular. Freedom to not be constrained by the consensus or the crowd. I'm against Common Core because I believe in intellectual integrity, the integration, the integrity, the integration of head and heart and fact and faith that is directed by the student's thirst for truth and not the state's hunger for control. I'm against Common Core because I believe in the liberal arts. I believe in the liberal arts. Sidebar, I've got a book entitled Why I'm a Liberal and Other Conservative Ideas. <laughs> Wrap your head around that one a couple times. Why I'm a liberal and other conservative ideas. My argument is as a conservative in our day and our time, I have greater liberty to debate what's true and right and wrong and real and false. I can debate that with a robust sense of freedom at Oklahoma Wesleyan University, a Christian institution, more so than I would ever be permitted to debate those same ideas at Michigan State University, my alma mater. We're the liberals. We are the ones who believe in liberty and freedom. And you know why? It's because we trust truth with a capital T to judge the debate at the end of the hour. I don't care about your popularity and your power. What I care about is what is true. That's freedom. So I'm against Common Core because I believe in the liberal arts. I believe in liberty and liberation and freedom. A free mind, a free man, rather than one that's held in bondage by politics and power and what is popular or what is common. I'm against Common Core because I believe in the humility of the student rather than the arrogance of the state. I'm against Common Core because I don't believe all paths are common or that they all lead to the same summit. I believe that some paths lead to danger and death and some lead to safety and salvation. And as an educator, I believe it's my obligation to help my students and my culture distinguish between the two. I am against Common Core because I believe that it's antithetical to the history of liberal education to celebrate the mindless march of lemmings careening over a cliff of commonality. I believe the Pied Piper's tune of popular opinion can be one of common deception rather than one of personal discernment. I am against Common Core because I'm tired. I'm very tired of the politically correct and boringly predictable ad hominem attacks used to call the questioning voice such as mine stupid and the tin foil hat wearing black helicopter conspiracy theorist that can't think his way out of a paper bag. I'm tired of that. <laughs> I am tired of the obvious ad populum fallacies implicit in the word common. I am against Common Core because of the inevitable assumption of mediocrity that has already resulted in many of its proponents not understanding the basic Socratic logic I just used. 
You see, folks, at Oklahoma Wesleyan University, I don't celebrate what's common. I just don't. I refuse to. I don't reward you for your mediocrity. I don't slap you on the back when you graduate after four years of education at Oklahoma Wesleyan and say, congratulations, you've measured up to the constructed consensus, to the common opinion. And frankly, if you're my students, I say this to you often, I do not care what the consensus is, and I surely don't care about your opinion. <laughs> Frankly, students, you shouldn't care about mine. You see, consensus is deceptive, and opinions are always dangerous. Pol Pot had an opinion, Mao had an opinion, Robespierre had an opinion, Chavez had, Chavez had a consensus, and Hitler and Stalin had opinions. And all of the despots of history forced their opinions on the public, declaring they had a consensus as to what would be common. They decided what the core of acceptable thinking would be. They decided what would be taught and not taught. They decided what was going to take place in the classroom. Not the teacher, not the parent, but the government. And none of this ended well. None of this led to liberty or liberation. All of this led to bondage because, hear me on this, opinions always enslave. Opinions always enslave. But Jesus told us, the truth shall set you free. Not opinions, not the consensus, and not what is common. At Oklahoma Wesleyan, I believe that the best education is one that indeed liberates. It liberates us from the consequences of those things that are wrong and frees us to live within the beauty of those things that are right. I am passionate about a liberal arts education, if you haven't figured that out yet. An education that is driven by a hunger for answers rather than the protection of opinions. An education that is not subject to the ebb and flow of personal agendas or political fads. An education that is not afraid to put all ideas on the table because there is confidence that in the end we will embrace what is true and discard what is false. At Oklahoma Wesleyan, we believe in freedom. Freedom of thought and freedom of expression and the freedom, the freedom to dissent from the consensus. We are energized by the unapologetic pursuit of truth. And wherever it leads, I am confident in the words, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I am an integrationist. And I maintain that truth cannot be segregated into false dichotomies, but that it's an integrated whole. And a liberally educated person recognizes that we cannot embrace the common ideas of postmodernity, ideas that segregate personal life from private life and the head from the heart and fact from faith and our belief from behavior, ideas that lead to hypocrisy rather than integrity. I'm against Common Core because I believe there are ideas that are tested by time, defended by reason, and validated by experience, and many of these ideas, especially in our day and time, are anything but common. I believe in the law of nature and nature's God. I believe that we can know that rape is wrong and that the Holocaust was bad and that hatred and racism are to be reviled. I believe that even though we cannot produce these truths in a test that we hold them to be self-evident laws that no human being can deny regardless of what is common to the culture or to the king. I am against Common Core because as an educator, I recognize that when we exchange the truth of God for a lie, that we build a house of cards that will fall to mankind's inevitable temper tantrum of seeking control and power. History tells us time and again that to deny what is wrong, right and true and embrace what is wrong and false is to fall prey to the rule of the gang, what David Horowitz calls in his book, Left Illusions, the rule of the gang. If you have no measuring rod to measure those things that are right or wrong, other than your opinion and your power and what you declare to be common, the gang wins. Or even worse, the rule of one, the despot wins. 
We need to look no further than the lessons of history and the lessons of the despots I just mentioned above as proof to my point. You see, I'm against Common Core because I believe in liberty. Liberty, which is the antithesis of slavery. Slavery that is the unavoidable consequence of lies. Lies about who we are as people, lies about what is right and wrong, and lies about man and lies about God. As I bring this home, folks, I've got a question for you. Does describing, excuse me, does subscribing to a common core of ideas constructed by some faceless group of bureaucrats let me back up. Does subscribing to a common core of ideas constructed by some faceless group of bureaucrats behind some closed door, often some unknown location, make you feel more or less free? Do we really have more intellectual liberty at the end of the day, or are we becoming more and more enslaved by the constructs of the Ubermensch, the German word for Superman? The power brokers, the elites, the fittest who have survived in the political arenas of campaigns and campuses. Are we free to live within the boundaries, the fences of beauty, of the classical liberal arts, of the university, the una verities, the una veritas? Or are we becoming more and more bound by groupthink and political correctness and the commonality? the commonality of what is popular, what M. Scott Peck called the diabolical human mind. You see, good education, complete education, liberal education must be grounded in the conservative respect for and the conservation of what is immutable and right and just and real. It should seek to reclaim what has been co-opted and to reveal what has been compromised. It should be free of intimidation and it should honor open inquiry and the right to dissent. It should have confidence in the measuring rod of truth, that unalienable standard that is bigger and better than the crowd, the consensus, or the common. In The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis scolded the self-confident young scholar by telling him that he was more of a puppet of popularity than he was a proponent of independent thinking. Lewis said, our opinions were not easily come by. I'll say this again. Lewis challenged the scholar, this smarter than thou young man, and he said, our opinions were not honestly come by. We simply found ourselves in contact with a certain current of ideas and we plunged into it. You know we just started automatically writing the kind of essays that got good marks and saying the kind of things that won applause. And from his own personal experience, Lewis knew that our desire for what is common more often than not leads us to pair at a party line and thus go with the flow of that current rather than challenge the status quo, paddle upstream, against what's popular. Lewis went further. Now hear me on this. This is good stuff. We allowed ourselves to drift, unresisting, unpraying, accepting every half-conscious solicitation from our desires. We reached a point where we no longer even believed. And I would add, no longer even learned. For Lewis, the common was not a measure of moral courage or cerebral discipline, but rather a sleepy acquiescence to the mesmerizing solicitations of what was trendy and in vogue. Finally, Lewis moves beyond criticism and he offers a solution. He shows us the way out. To awaken from the lazy dreams of self-deception, self we must return to the honest questions of childhood and humbly look for answers. Once you were a child, he said, once you knew what his inquiry was for. There was a time when you asked questions because you wanted answers and you were glad when you had found them. Become that child again. Thirst was made for water and inquiry was made for truth. In these words, Lewis echoes the promises of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. I'm a lifelong learner, and so are you. So are your kids. My journey and your journey is ultimately one that is guided by the immutable, the permanent, and the true, not by the transient constructs of popularity, politics, and power. All truth is true even if no one believes it, and all falsehood is false even if everyone believes it. 
and we will only find truth when we place our confidence in it and not what is common. Lewis tells us again in The Great Divorce that a sum can be put right but only by going back till you find the error and working it afresh from that point, never by simply going on. Common core is a mistake. It is not a fix for our educational system. It is an inaccurate sum, if you will. We cannot correct this and put the sum right until we acknowledge what's wrong and work the equation afresh from the beginning. Doubling down and simply going on would be as foolish as trying to force a three into the equation, two plus blank equals four. Until we go back and work it afresh from the point of error, we will not get the right answer, but instead get what is predictable and common, an error that we refuse to learn from. I have chosen not to get in the weeds, folks, because I'm not very good at discerning the details of the Common Core debate. I've chosen to even stay out of this robust exchange of ideas, this argument, if you will, until the last month or so. And the only reason I'm here today is I think Pat Campbell had me on his show about three weeks ago, and he asked me to comment on Common Core. And I said, I'd just like to know who is deciding what's common. And I'd like to know why I, as an academic, don't have the freedom to decide what I want to teach, when I want to teach it, how I want to teach it. And you know what? If I didn't do a good job, if I started teaching stupid ideas, like two plus two is five, then fire me. Fire me. And get somebody who knows what they're doing. Now that puts a lot of burden on you, and your communities, and your school boards, and your superintendents, and your teachers. Folks, you cannot abandon standards. You have to have fences or there is no freedom. You have to have law or there is no liberty. You have to have standards. But the question is, who's going to set them? Who's going to define them? And who's going to decide what ideas are good or bad, right or wrong, true or false for your culture and for your kids? Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, what is taught today in the classroom will be practiced tomorrow, tomorrow in your church and in your culture and in your corporations. And if you're teaching lousy ideas, stupid ideas, such as two plus two is five, then it is going to raise its ugly head in the leadership of your culture tomorrow. There's a reason for the mess we're in today. And the reason is bad ideas. I would argue you are responsible. The state of Oklahoma is responsible for defining those ideas. And if you don't like what the legislation of Oklahoma is defining as right ideas, then don't elect them. Elect somebody else that will guide Oklahoma toward the ideals that you hold dear. 